one of the most hotly debated, deeply disturbing and important books of Western civilization. To some, it was a veritable guidebook for tyrants and totalitarians. Mussolini loved it. Marxists recognized a fellow revolutionary. To others, it paved the way for ethnic and religious toleration, individual rights and modern democracies. But, fairly or unfairly, it has caused his name, Machiavelli, to ring through the centuries as a synonym for evil. Machiavelli is the first political thinker of the Christian era who systematically analyzed the requirements of power and survival. The Prince is a book about power. Political power at a time of city-states or principalities, ruled by men called princes. It amounts to 26 short chapters of analysis and opinion that range from the classification of government to advice on selecting staff. It was written to shock and re-educate its reader, and it still manages to do so, to challenge the political pieties of its day and explain to princes and prince wannabes how the game is really played. It tells the prince that before anything else, he must know how to fight. He must learn to be ruthless and cruel, to lie, break his word, and be ready to violate both morals and religious principles when needed. Though it also stresses the need to appear compassionate, moral, and devout. Some say Machiavelli invented modern politics. And when we read The Prince, we can see today's headlines. Many have dreamed up republics and principalities which have never in truth existed. The gap between how one should live and how one does live is so wide that a man who neglects what is actually done for what should be done is on the way to self-destruction. Machiavelli's focus on what is actually done is in tune with his times. Copernicus is studying the heavens, and Leonardo is dissecting cadavers, both trying to learn how God actually did it, to learn not from theory, but direct observation. But dissections and autopsies are never pretty. One of the uglier discoveries attributed to Machiavelli is the idea that the end justifies the means. Machiavelli is very clear that the end is what counts. He says this in a number of places, and it seems to us a very tough argument. There are some situations in which the more the survival is threatened, the narrower the margin of choice becomes, unless you say you would rather have your society destroyed than to pursue a marginal means. What would you do to prevent this from happening to your people? What would you not do? Would you lie, violate treaties, assassinate people? Just where would you draw the line? anywhere on the other hand if you are winning a war and your enemy is all but finished how far would you go to minimize your own casualties Machiavelli was acquainted with the moral ambiguities of power he was a realist Machiavelli pursued what some scholars have called amoral realism Prudence consists in being able to assess the nature of a particular threat and in accepting the lesser evil. Machiavelli's maxims. What is our objective here? What is our interest here? What are the means available? What is the best thing that can happen? What is the worst thing that can happen? But what we need to ask ourselves is whether we really are in desperate straits, whether we really are up against the hard laws of necessity that Machiavelli is describing. I think much of the time we assume we are and are not. Like politicians today, Machiavelli justifies harsh or deceitful means as necessary to the common good. But his focus is on the presence or absence of power. 
What is it? How do you get it? How do you keep it? That separation between ethics and politics, the belief that the good prince is not necessarily the good man, that appearance matters more than reality, that deception can be practiced, that it is better to be feared than loved, all those famous conclusions of the prince are ones that have eternally struck people as the most difficult and, and indeed painful question about politics, and they don't want to confront it. They don't want to believe that someone thought those things. Machiavelli was a Sunday Christian. He did not dispute the essential dogmas of the Catholic faith. He simply put them to one side when he came to think and talk about politics at all. Some think I should teach men the way to heaven, but I would rather teach them the way to hell so they'll know how to go around it. Niccolo went to work for the Republican government of Piero Sodorini. Machiavelli worked for the committee that was in charge of defense and foreign affairs. He took care of the needs of the military, and he went on special missions to foreign courts. And then he was all throughout uh, Italy. He met uh, many lords and rulers, and naturally among them is Cesare. Borgia. Borgia is a legend in his own time of ruthlessness and depravity. In one instance, Borgia invites his enemies to peace talks and has them all killed. That was the uh, main uh, impression that he got from, uh, from uh, uh, Borgia, this cold blood and this capacity of uh, using violence, let's say, well, crudeltà bene usata, that is for a very lucid political uh, goal, uh, not just a display of power, but in a very functional, uh, functional uh, way. In order to maintain his state, a prince is often forced to act in defiance of good faith, of charity, of kindness, of religion. He should not deviate from what is good if that is possible but he should know how to do evil if that is necessary. The notion that necessity could justify behavior which was not otherwise virtuous or moral was actually accepted by almost all of the ancient thinkers. Lincoln's critics in his day uh, thought he was a dictator, thought he was a tyrant, uh, thought he was undemocratic. Uh, thought, in spite of all the folksy backwoods charm, uh, that he, he was an egomaniac and was operating unconstitutionally much of the time. In the case of, for example, the suspension of habeas corpus, he probably was. Um, and, and this is a, perhaps a great uh, example of Machiavellian leadership in a democracy. There is a physics of politics, and sooner or later, every leader discovers for himself. Taking everything into account, he will find that some of the things that appear to be virtues will, if he practices them, ruin him. And some of the things that appear to be vices will bring him security and prosperity. The personal Machiavelli seems entirely human. He is compassionate, witty, and profane, even sometimes obscene. He is married, but he is attracted to other women, and they to him. Machiavelli was a great guy. He was friendly, affable, loyal to his friends. He loved to go out drinking. He loved women. He loved good conversation. Uh, just an ordinary, nice guy. Well, ordinary may not be the best word, but certainly Machiavelli seems anything but Machiavellian. He is personable. He is also a very talented guy. He wrote the best, the best comedy of our literature, La Mandragola, in 1518. And uh, okay, there is a comedy with the bitter and even the somber uh, undertones, but it's a lively uh, uh, play, wonderful. Niccolo begins to work on what he calls the discourses on the first ten books of Titus Livy. It is a book of commentaries on the work of that Roman historian and makes a strong case for a republican form of government. 
Then all of a sudden, he decides to try to get back into the government himself and writes in furious time, in three months' time, The Prince. He interrupts the writing of the discourses to take off his time to write The Prince because he's anxious to get back into politics, into, into government life. Are there two Machiavellis here? One writing a book on the Republican form of government and the other, almost simultaneously, writing advice for tyrants. I look at Machiavelli's Prince as a work on statesmanship and the discourses as a statement of desirable objectives. And so I don't find the two incompatible with it. Machiavelli's breakthrough is that he gives us the persona, the personality of the political realist. He gives us uh, the, the inner discipline of the strategist. And this is a discipline that involves uh, a great deal of self-control, such that uh, one cannot revel in conquest, uh, one can uh, not strike out impulsively, uh, one has to be constantly scrutinizing one's own motives. One must constantly uh, attend to others carefully, even civilly, uh, lest uh, you give away your own hand uh, and while you're trying to discern the, the, uh, their own missteps or their own deceptions. And so what we get is someone who's not quite a Christian knight, but is nonetheless often very well behaved. He also gives us the political actor. The prince may or may not keep his word may or may not be humane, devout, a man's man, a family man, depending on the circumstances. But he must appear to be all of those things. Men in general judge by their eyes rather than by their hands, because everyone is in a position to watch. Few are in a position to come in close touch with you. Everyone sees what you appear to be. Few experience what you really are. And so there is a larger sense in which the prince is playing a role, which is to appear to be the things he knows he must not necessarily be, and to appear to act on principle when what he's acting on is calculation, or what the modern world would refer to as long-term strategy. But perhaps most important, Machiavelli's prince is a political artist. He sees the prince as somebody who takes matter as though it were marble, and imposes a form on it, as though that person were a sculptor. Form out of stone, order out of chaos, civilization from savagery. Michelangelo and Machiavelli's prince have much in common. Trouble is, raw material for the prince is human flesh and blood. For that, the prince must learn how and when to be cruel. And he must have studied war. Machiavelli, I think, is most useful, in my judgment, uh, when you're thinking about international relations rather than the government within a state or a city. International relations are different from internal matters for one reason, because there is no law between nations. Uh, in reality, there, you really do have a jungle out there. And that's different from states, where you do have a law which has legitimacy and which uh, monopolizes force in the hands of the government. Uh, well, the, the world out there isn't like that. And we, we in the world today, in the West, in the United States, we hate that idea. It makes us very unhappy and very uncomfortable, and we refuse to believe it much of the time. And so this is where Machiavelli is most valuable, in reminding us of those gross realities which haven't changed. Henry Kissinger has been called the American Machiavelli by admirers as well as critics. That would make Richard Nixon his prince. We destabilized governments. We tried to assassinate foreign leaders. Uh, we did some things, I think, again, particularly in uh, singling out the Nixon administration, that were a violation of our principles, our ideals. I believe that we are living on the hinge of history, a new, a new order in the world uh, to play, replace the old Cold War order. And what is important is that this country find a new prince, find a patriot who can help us define what the, the next era is.
I compare fortune to one of those violent rivers which, when they are enraged, flood the plains, tear down trees and buildings. Everyone flees before them. Everybody yields to their impetus. There is no possibility of resistance. Yet although such is their nature, one may still take precautions when they are flowing quietly, building dams and dikes to control them in flood time. So it is with fortune. Rivers are not to be trusted. Neither are men. 